next up, we have uh, Graham. So welcome Graham Nelson to the stage. So Graham's a co-owner of Northwest Physio Group uh, along with Russell and he started his RM training in 2011 as well. Thanks Dan. Mine's a little bit of a heavier topic today. So low back disorders, that's what they're known as now, expanding the bio in the biopsychosocial model. So what I want you to get out of uh, this presentation is, well firstly a brief overview of um, low back disorders uh, and where the research is at the moment and some directions. Now I found this really daunting, there's a whole lot of research in this area. I'll take you through the evidence for a whole body assessment for a low back disorder and an example of what's possible with a whole body approach. So where are we now in terms of the research? Uh, well, as we know, it's a very common condition. Uh, it's, very, uh, it's very prevalent, lifetime prevalence of 85%. Um, research in this area has been very extensive. Uh, there's been lots of um, treatment options trialled and tested. Uh, interestingly enough, there's been a concurrent rise in associated healthcare costs, chronicity and disability. So it begs the question, are we on the right track here uh, with, this, with this group of um, uh, disorders? The biopsychosocial model has been well, well, well established in the research. Um, it has been validated. But some of the earlier research we found uh, didn't find efficacy for, for physio. Uh, when compared to um, GP advice or placebo. And that's probably largely because uh, we tended to see this condition as just a single condition on its own. And we know that um, low back pain is a lot more complex than that. So in an effort to expand on the bio uh, element, the biomedical element, um, subgrouping came in. And uh, that's been postulated as a means of improving the likelihood of an effect size, getting a greater effect size and greater outcomes in this, in this uh, population. There's been several classification systems that have been developed. Um, some are based on pathoanatomical anatomical, uh, presentations, others based on uh, prognosis, and some are based on movement impairment systems, such as the one uh, developed by Salmon. And that's based on the premise that um, People use repeated, speci uh, specific dire repeated direction specific movements through their day. So that causes a loading effect in certain structures and uh, loss of movement in other directions. So does classifying work? Well, the jury's still out. Um, there's lots of dissension in the, re in, a, in the research world as to whether classifying into subgroups makes any difference uh, to not classifying at all. Uh, so some st studies have shown favourable effects, others, others not. The most recent ones done by Ford and, and uh, his group of um, uh, researchers, Hahn, etc., in Melbourne, um, have been very good studies actually. And um, uh, they've found significant differences um, in uh, back pain and leg pain, functional measures, and also costs of care when patients have been classified into certain subgroups and uh, then individualised treatment administered based on a pathanatomical, psychosocial and neurophysiological factors to their lower back disorder. So I think this research is really sort of at the cutting edge of what we, um, what's going on in the field at the moment. Uh, if we look at the classification system they've used, um, it's very Maitland based, it's very biomedical. Um, we'd see these sort of presentations. We learn a lot about this in, uh, undergraduate, in our undergraduate years. Uh, the question is, you know, how many of these conditions can we, or how many of these subgroups can we affect um, with uh, looking elsewhere? And what other contributing factors could help patients in these subgroups? And that's what that, those studies haven't determined yet. So when they talked about the neurophysiological aspect, they didn't actually extend their assessment to beyond the lumbar spine. So we think we can affect many of these groups, particularly probably these last three, um, with uh, finding other contributing factors. So that's the potential for where we have to uh, affect the research um, from an RM point of view, I guess. So the current understanding uh, is that, um, that lower back disorders are seen as a protective mechanism. Uh, and it's produced by the neuroimmune and endocrine systems. 
in response to a perceived level of danger uh, in an effort to, um, and a disruption of homeostasis. So it's a complex interaction between psychological, social, lifestyle and many other factors. So it's really viewed in a larger contextual framework now based on patient values, therapist knowledge and the available evidence base. And that sort of is a, the hallmarks of the evidence-based uh, practice paradigm. If we want to improve outcomes in this, in this uh, patient um, group, if we look at the things we can uh, affect, uh, there's patient factors and therapist factors. Out of the therapist factors, all these things we can affect and we have control over. Now, if we have limiting beliefs about this pa uh, patient group, if we believe things are only pathoanatomical, could that affect our results? I think so. If we had uh, better clinical reasoning skills to prove that remote areas are connected to lower back disorders, could that improve our results? I think it could. If we had better communication skills, if we were more open and honest with our communication with our patients, could that improve our results? I think definitely. So there's a massive role for us to work within this category of clients, not only this category, but this category um, particularly, to improve the outcomes. So are we being as open and as honest as we can as physios? If we know that lower back disorders um, are a complex multi multifactorial uh, condition and sub subgrouping may or may not help, can we expand on the therapist factors to improve outcomes? And, and, and as I said, I think we can. What if we had a system that um, treated every client as an individual uh, and assessed the individual variances in their musculoskeletal makeup, uh, including their beliefs and values? And when we administer treatment based on a biopsychosocial model, that would care careful and thorough reassessment of changes in their um, movement and response to treatment. So why not assess the whole body in this, in this group? It really makes sense. So this is where the regional independence model comes in. And the, the regional independence model really supports that view of looking at the whole body. It states that seemingly unrelated impairments in remote anatomical regions can contribute or be associated with the patient's primary complaint. So we know that this in the back pain research world, we've seen um, relationships between decreased strength, control, range of movement in the lower quarter uh, for back pain sufferers. We know that pain is an output. I won't go through all this, but we know that pain is an output dependent on the number of inputs. And those inputs can come from the musculoskeletal system from anywhere in the body, uh, from biopsychosocial, from neurophysiological, etc. And basically, this is to restore or promote recovery and restore homeostasis. So this case study should uh, give you a good example. So Peter was a chap I saw recently. He's a 64-year-old uh, lawyer presented with a five-day history of lower back pain. Uh, and uh, he, the pain had been so bad that he'd gone to the emergency department the week before and he was referred by uh, the emergency doctor to us. There was no red flags. Uh, he was basically in uh, otherwise good health. He had had a history of, of low back pain, uh, and this was the worst episode. Now, the important values for him were he wanted to learn how to prevent this from reoccurring. He wanted to also regain his full function so he could play with his nieces and nephews and also participate in his activities of daily living. We did a whole body assessment. And I won't go through everything uh, that we went through here, but there was quite a few uh, muscle knots we found in various parts of the body. Restricted range of movement, lumbar uh, and neck as well. Uh, hip range, the hamstrings was probably one of the main areas. Uh, and there was many other joint restrictions as well uh, throughout his body and some muscle, um, some motor control issues also. So through consultation with Peter, uh, we determined that the hamstring range uh, was a good measure of improvement. So we involved him in the process, and this related well to his lower back condition. So using our treatment-directed testing, or treatment trials as we now call them, we found several structures that made good changes to the hamstring range. So 
In this first round of uh, treatment trials, Peter went from minus 50 to minus 20 degrees of hamstring. Uh, so that was a very good result for the first uh, session. On the following day, he represented and he had regressed to some degree. So the picture here shows um, where he got back to. So he got back to about minus 40. Now, interestingly enough, we went through all the structures that had caused those changes uh, at the time and reassessed them, and they were a lot better. And a lot of those structures were actually in the lumbar spine. Uh, the most obvious structure that uh, really stood out was the C3 facet on the left, and uh, we worked quite diligently on that. And working on that alone produced that result in, in one session. When reassessed, his uh, other movements also improved. So the C3 facet we labelled as the PCF, or provisional PCF, because it changed most of the uh, movement signs in his body and most of the other dysfunctional structures. Why was it under particular load? Well, this is probably one example, uh, or one contributing factor, poor posture. We did a lot of motor control uh, changes as well to that. Uh, now the question is, could we have achieved a similar result by not looking at the whole body? Now given the PCF or the primary contributing factor was in the neck, if we didn't look beyond the thoracic spine, we wouldn't have found that. Now could we have given, um, would we have been helping Peter as much as we could have uh, if we hadn't done that? I don't think so. Would we have, um, would the risk of recurrence have increased uh, by not finding this PCF? I think it would have. So I think we uh, have done, um, uh, done well to find that and I think this really adds weight to the, the, the whole body approach. So, so to summarise, lower back pain is a complex multi-regional condition that requires an individualised biopsychosocial approach. The regional independence model provides rationale for expanding on the bio model because local symptoms can have remote causes. Uh, the current neuroscience research supports this as well. And I think we need further research to determine the efficacy of a systematic whole body approach in the physiotherapy management of lower back disorders. Thank you.